in performing, whether it is concert work or on the stage, it is absolutely necessary to be in the present. What does this mean? Well, for one thing, it means that even though in the past you have rehearsed and memorized exactly how things go, in performance, you are telling a version of the story which is unique to that set of circumstances and will never be repeated in exactly the same way. The performer who is in the present is aware and open to be communicated with and to respond as we do in real life in the present. Though the past can be cherished, learned from, or even repudiated, and the future can be anticipated, dreaded, or planned for, life also must be lived in the present because how else can we be open to be communicated with to see the signposts? By any reasonable reckoning, I should not be here. I was born in a town of 1,100 people in a county the size of Massachusetts with a population of fewer than 200,000 souls in a state bordered on in three sides by Quebec, New Brunswick, and the Atlantic Ocean. And I should add with only two symphony orchestras and one very small opera company in the entire state. Had I remained where I started, I would have attended a school system with no music. In fact, no arts of any kind. And though music was an integral part of my family, it would probably have remained an avocation. But things happen. My father died in August of 1959, just three months before my fourth birthday. This set off a chain of moves, decisions, events over the next five years, which culminated in my mother marrying my stepfather and his successful bid to become county sheriff in the 1964 general election. This precipitated our move to the county seat, a bustling town of 7,000 people. The most important change for my future would turn out to be the presence of the arts in my new school system. I began both choir and band in the fifth grade, and from the seventh grade until I graduated, I was in every musical ensemble offered and appeared in one operetta and two plays. I should add that I'd been singing solos in church since the age of six, so you might assume that I was well on my path to becoming a professional in the arts. But in junior high, I discovered that I loved science and I was good at it. By the time I took college biology in my sophomore year, I was completely hooked. So in addition to that and general science, I took anatomy and physiology, college chemistry and college physics, and I decided to become a doctor. And in the fall of 1973, I entered the University of Maine as a pre-med major. I should add that this choice may have been partly a rebellion against every old white-haired church lady who would come up to me after the service and say, of course you're going to go into music. It always annoyed me because I was a good student and I knew I could do many things if I chose to do so. So even though I was not a music major, I was in two choirs that fall semester and at the director's urging, signed up to take voice lessons with him in the spring semester. And in February of that semester, I was made tenor soloist for the spring performance of Mozart's Requiem with the Oratorio Society and the University Orchestra. I'm not sure if that was a signpost or a cudgel, but I heeded it and decided that I was supposed to be a music major. Even as an undergraduate, I began a fledgling professional performance career, singing for pay with several groups all around the state of Maine. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be a famous opera singer. But things happen. Midway through my third year with my voice teacher, my voice, which had taken off like a rocket, began to give me trouble. And I developed all sorts of vocal issues and my instrument began to seriously deteriorate. Several of us in that voice studio were experiencing similar difficulties. I had always been a fearless performer, but now my confidence was shaken and performing became a struggle instead of the delight, the sheer delight that it had always been. And I was also at a loss to project my future beyond graduating if I could not sing. I said to myself, I should have stayed in pre-med. However, that same year, a new voice teacher had been hired, and some of us began to notice the ease with which her students sang. 
Two of my best friends switched to that teacher. One even insisted that the dean allow him to switch mid-semester. But I am not a very brave person. And since my voice teacher was also my advisor and the music director of opera and the orchestra conductor, I was afraid that my remaining two semesters might be a nightmare. The very day I graduated, I took my first lesson with the other teacher and she said, I'm pretty sure I can fix you. You will not sing in public again until I give you permission. And when I say you are ready, you will audition for grad school at Boston University and you will study with my teacher. Pretty big signpost. So I returned home to my parents' house and took a job as a full-time correctional officer in the county jail. Yes, you heard me correctly. Remember, he was the county sheriff, okay. Every week on my day off, I made the two hour trip to the university and took a lesson with my new teacher. Those lessons were initially very difficult as I struggled to learn sound, healthy vocal technique, and I often wept listening to the tapes of those lessons which she insisted I make. This was a low spot in my life for sure, but gradually things improved and singing became more enjoyable and I thought there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. Fast forward to almost two years. In the spring of 1980, I auditioned for the master's program in voice performance at Boston University. I was accepted and offered a graduate assistantship. I was going to Boston. Another signpost. I should mention that at age 25, I'd been outside the state of Maine exactly three times. Once to upstate New York to visit distant relatives, once to Hartford, Connecticut, to a summer music camp, and once to Boston to audition for grad school. I'd never even been to New York to see an opera or a show on Broadway. In that very first year at BU, I met a man named Leonard Atherton. Remember this name, Leonard Atherton. He was the director of the vocal choral division of Boston University's summer high school music school at Tanglewood. Nestled in the Berkshire Mountains, in Western Massachusetts, Tanglewood is the summer home of the Boston Symphony and is the location of one of the premier summer music festivals in the country. I was hired to be a member of the coaching teaching staff for the summer of 1981. This was a grad work study position and at that time paid $5.50 an hour plus room and board plus a summer pass to all the concerts. I have no idea what that is all worth in today's money, but let me just say that I would take that deal again in a heartbeat. At the time, I had no idea what a signpost Leonard Atherton would turn out to be for me. I do not want to lose money. That summer, I not only heard performances by some of the finest artists in the world, but I also got to teach music on a level that I'd never even imagined. Getting to coach alongside members of the Boston Symphony, and I found that I loved that. I also got a taste of what it would be like to interact with students in a total way, not just teaching them, but eating with them, playing volleyball, volleyball with them after dinner and really participating in their lives. This would turn out to be a significant signpost. I returned to Tanglewood for three more summers. Meanwhile, I'd graduated from Boston University, had established a successful private voice studio and was developing a modestly successful freelance career as a singer. I had hoped to teach at the college level in some capacity, and eventually a colleague set me up to apply for a full-time position being created at a tiny little college north of Boston. I was her personal choice to succeed her, and I thought I was a shoe in I never even got an interview. There were over 100 applicants, and 75% of them had earned doctorates. School, really, again? Before I could process this signpost, I got a call from Leonard Atherton. You know, the guy from Tanglewood. He had recently candidated for and been offered the position of director of orchestras at a school called Ball State in a place called Muncie, Indiana, wherever that was. And he said to me, so if your international opera career is not taken off yet, why don't you come out to Indiana and get a doctorate? And then his wife got on the phone and said, why don't you and Patty get married and both come? Double signpost. So, newly engaged in March of 1987, we drove from Boston to Muncie without stopping, I might add. It's 19 hours, wouldn't try that now for, for the world. 
And we, uh, we got there, we spent a week auditioning for and getting to know the voice faculty at Ball State. In April, we were notified that we both received full rides to, to Ball State. We got married on August 15th and on August 28th, we landed in Muncie with everything we owned in the world. We planned to complete our doctorates and return to the East Coast to find jobs and settle down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But things happen. Let me just say at this point in my life, I had never heard a praise chorus, never heard of Sandy Patty or the Church of God. I knew that Bill and Gloria Gaither were a people because I had seen one song printed called He Touched Me and their names were on it. However, in my second year at Ball State, I was approached by my new accompanist, Gail Stewart, and asked if I was interested in a part-time voice teaching job because Anderson University was looking to fill two. I said, yes, I'm very interested, but where is that? And she said, just down the road. It turns out that she had previously been on the piano faculty here at AU, most definitely another signpost. I came over for an audition. I taught in front of Rick Sowers, Barbara Douglas, and Greta Dominic, and was hired as one of the two adjunct voice teachers. And during the 1989-1990 academic year, I taught here one day a week, Thursday, while completing my last year of classes at Ball State. AU did not rehire the other adjunct signpost, and the following year I was appointed a lecturer, a lesser though full-time rank which has gratefully been long extinct. And later in the 1991 academic year I had to candidate for the tenure track position was once more, which was once more open after a two-year hiatus. And I had the strange experience of trying to teach while following Dale Benson's orders to stay out of sight while the other finalists did his visit. In my interview with President Edwards, he asked me if I thought I could see myself at AU for the long haul. I needed the job, so I of course said yes, but I have kept my word. Now you know how I got here, but that's not actually the story. I am not necessarily a perfect fit for this institution, nor is it for me, but it turns out that all the signposts were right. It turns out that this is where my life's work was supposed to be. And by that, I mean the place and time where I could most effectively be Christ's hands and feet in the way that my particular journey with its particular bumps and turns constructed me to be. I have learned that in addition to my institutional and professional preparation, my personal journey in general and most specifically being broken vocally and then being put back together have made me uniquely prepared to serve in this place that when it is at its best seeks to bind up the wounded, educate the whole person and seek and serve Christ in one another. I have been privileged for the last 32 years to have had the partial stewardship of the lives and gifts of over 200 private voice students, 300 women and men in choirs I have conducted, and hundreds in the casts of the more than 40 musicals and opera productions for which I have served as vocal coach and or music director and or stage director. And I have worked alongside of some of the most gifted and incredible human beings on this planet. It has been an incredibly enriching, at times heartbreaking, often humbling, but always rewarding experience. For many years, I could not imagine retiring. I simply could not see what that would look like in my mind's eye. Then in the fall of 2016, my wife and I were fortunate enough to get concurrent sabbaticals. And at the end of that August, instead of returning from the Jersey Shore to Indiana, as was our usual pattern, we went back up to Maine to the Lake Cottage and stayed there until October 15. I saw the glorious Maine foliage for the first time since 1979. Patty and I and our dog Pippi enjoyed long days of solitude and industry, but at a slower pace. And we found pleasure in each other's company, the passing loons, binge watching British television, and of course, time with members of my family. 
The gift of those eight weeks were the first signpost pointing to the fact that it was soon becoming time to wrap up this chapter of my life so that the next one could be written. Add to that the signpost of diminishing stamina for 11 hour days, six days a week for six week production schedules at the rate of at least two productions a year. And truth be told, COVID was perhaps the final signpost. I should always also mention that on this Sunday, May 2nd, I will be speaking and singing at Leonard Atherton's funeral. That somehow feels so right and so fitting. And just what is the next chapter, you may ask? Well, I have some ideas, but my plan for now is to be in the present and to watch for the signposts. They have never failed me yet. Thank you all for listening.